Taylor. I'm Kat. And welcome to Square Mile of Murder. Hello. Hi. Woo! Yeah! Uh, today, we have another water-based case. Say that five times fast. Uh, because if you weren't scared of open water, apparently we're on a mission to make sure you are by the end of this month. Because, <laughs> like, actually, though, how many... We've done Blue Men of the Minch. Mary Celeste. Oh, yeah, the Mary Celeste. Lake Bodum. Lake Bodum. Which, okay, not open water, but you know. Eh, water hazards. Not, like, golf course water hazards, but, like, hazardous waters. Oh, the Panama Hikers, that oh, had a little bit. Yeah. Honestly, even, like, Roanoke the, a little yeah, bit. I was just going to say Roanoke. <laughs> Like, the <laughs> dangers of hurricane season. <laughs> There's even an honor honorary canoe mention in tomorrow's episode. See, there you go. Like, what more could you possibly want? There's some water in my, uh, ha like, actual Halloween day episode. Oh. Well, see. Basically, what we're saying is, you should fear water in all forms no matter where you are or what you're doing <laughs> i mean you say that i fucking love water oh same i i'm a pisces i have to love water well i'm a cancer we're both water signs see there you go i'm literally my sign is literally fish mine's a crab so yeah we won't be we'll be brave and and enjoy the water for everyone else. Everyone else, yeah. just just pack it in. Just don't yeah, even... Be careful, wear like five life jackets when you even see some water. Yeah. You know, like those little arm floaties? That's what I recommend. <laughs> That's how I learned to swim when I was like three. Like little mm. <sighs> inflatable <sighs> arm floaty thingies. Yeah. Like this. We had those. Nice pool noodle. Security noodle. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we're just, we're here to scare the shit out of you, basically. Uh, <laughs> and today we are off on an adventure to a country that we haven't been to before on this show, or in real life. I mean, I put that in the script, I assume you haven't been. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Fascinated by it, we'll never visit. Horrified by yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah anyway you'll understand why in a second um a part of the reason we haven't been there on the show or or in real life or, or i should say maybe in real life or on the show is because pretty much nobody goes to this country ever except for sort of like the dark tourist tourism crowd uh because the country we're gonna talk about is north korea it's a bit hard to get in and also to get out is the thing. Yeah. So, you know. And uh, we are going to talk about ghost ships washing up around the shores of the Sea of Japan. Now, because we've never been in real life or in the show, this is our chance to offend Everyone. Here's the thing. In Korea. Here's the thing in North Korea. They're not going to hear this. <laughs> so here's a little bit of background, which will eventually, you'll see why it's relevant. <laughs> <laughs> so the Korean Peninsula, I'm just going to assume, as most of us know, is located in East Asia. Following the end of the Second World War, the country was divided uh, along the... 38th parallel with the north supported by the Soviet Union and the south supported by the USA. Uh, the country was divided in September 1945, uh, which marked the beginning of the Korean conflict, not the Korean War. Mm. So the end of the Second World War kind of marked the beginning of the Korean conflict. Technically, it's still going on. 
War broke out in 1950 when the North invaded the South and an armistice agreement was brokered in 1953 which led to a ceasefire but not a peace treaty which crucially (laughs) still leaves Korea divided along the 38th parallel. So when the ceasefire was reached the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, was created along the border to act as kind of like a buffer zone Mm -hmm. between the two countries. There is an incredible satellite photo, which we'll link in the show notes, which shows the light pollution from both countries um, and like just sort of into the Russian Far East. And you can literally see the North Korean and Russian border and the border along the DMZ because of the lack of what's described as noticeable light. Yeah. But yeah, you've got all this light pollution from Seoul. Yeah. And then and then suddenly it just all stops. Yeah, there's like a there's like a very sort of distinct line that goes Yeah. And then it's just like Which is obviously the the DMZ. Yeah. Just just fuck all. Yeah. Except yeah. for so is that Pyongyang. little spot? Yeah, Pyongyang, that's what I thought. Since the ceasefire began in 1953, leaving Korea divided into two, the two countries have developed very differently, to put it mildly. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail because, to be honest, we don't really know enough about Korea to accurately talk about it. Well, South Korea has become like most other countries in that it attracts tourists from all over the world and... People from South Korea, in turn, travel all over the world. Um, And food, music, art, films, TV shows are all exported to other parts of the world. Seoul is one of the, like, centers of technological development in the world. Like, it is massively into tech. The same high-techness cannot be said of North Korea, (laughs) which has earned itself the nickname, bless its heart, of the Hermit Kingdom, due to its borders being closed to most foreign leaders and rulers, diplomats, and travelers. Uh, And as loath as we are to mention him on this show, and as much as we try to forget he exists... Uh, former President Trump made history in 2018 as the first U.S. leader to meet with North Korea's leader or chairman, Kim Jong-un. I mean, I don't think we can really say a lot of good things about that, but... No! It, was, it did make history. <laughs> yes, like, it, it was a, 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 a rare and unexpected event, but there's a reason that it was unexpected Uh, so due to the closed off nature of the country there are plenty of rumors about what's going on in north korea i think it's safe to say that all of them are bad so according to amnesty international north korea's chairman and his ruling party are violating pretty much every basic human right repress any kind of freedom of expression or opinion including um freedom of expression independent media freedom of the press religious freedom Political opposition parties are also banned, as are trade unions and other civil society organisations, which covers a whole host, is like an umbrella term for a lot of different types of organisations. Yeah. But that's a wording that Amnesty International use. Mm-hmm. Um, arrest and imprisonment are arbitrary. Again, according to, and according to Amnesty International, you can be imprisoned for as little as not showing sufficient reverence to the country's leader. There are approximately 100,000 people in prison camps, and you don't even have to be guilty to find yourself in a prison camp. You can be found guilty by association, which just means that you are related to a guilty person in some way, including being the child of a guilty person. Because, yeah, young children are also imprisoned in these work camps. It's, It's not good. No. Uh, The other major claim from Amnesty International is that there are widespread food shortages across the country. 
All of these claims have been substantiated by those who have managed to escape, as well as through other means open to the likes of the UN and other global bodies. Those who have been imprisoned in the camp speak of being forced to work long hours on corn farms, being split up into groups, and if that group didn't fulfill their quota each day, they were punished. Uh, part of the punishment is torture and violent assault, not just at the hands of the guards, uh, but other prisoners are were also invited to beat the prisoners who failed to achieve their quotas. Uh, another part of the punishment is withholding food, which is already far below what an adult needs to function properly. And this leads to prisoners harvesting even less food because they're too weak and exhausted to work. Uh, but the farms in the prison camps aren't the only way of providing food for the country. One of the other main ways is the country's fishing industry. Uh, North Korea has two sea coasts, the West Sea, but that one's on the West Coast, as West Sea yeah. might indicate. Um, and the Sea of Japan uh, is on the East Coast. Um, and North Korea also has many rivers and waterways that run throughout the country and along the northern borders with China and Russia. Uh, just like in the prison camps, the government imposes quotas on fishermen in an attempt to ensure that there's enough food to feed the nation. And if these quotas are not met, they are reportedly there are reportedly severe and violent punishments. So every country has territorial waters, which refer to an area of water which that country has jurisdiction over. In terms of the sea and open water, this is known as territorial seas. Territor real water can also apply to like inland waterways. Mm -hmm. uh, territorial seas extend 12 nautical miles, which is 14 regular miles <laughs> or 22 kilometers from the baseline. Uh, from the baseline, which is the low water mark along the coastline when like the tide's mm -hmm. out. Uh, and that's defined by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea in 1982. <laughs> it is a lot more complex than that because some countries have overlapping territorial seas and there is also a contiguous zone which extends 24 nautical miles from the baseline and, and the exclusive economic zone which extends up to 200 nautical miles from the baseline. The country has special rights over its exclusive economic zone in regards to fishing and the use of marine resources such as drilling for oil. And beyond this zone is international waters. So countries can sell fishing rights to other countries to fish in their territorial waters or extended economic zones. But there are UN sanctions on some countries, North Korea being one of them, prohibiting them from doing this. Mm. And you might be thinking... Cool story, fishing rights and whatnot. When did this turn into a maritime podcast? I've already told you well, this month. Yeah. 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 Well, keep all this in mind because it will become relevant. <laughs> Between 2011 and 2019, at least 656 North Korean fishing boats have washed up in Japan. Uh, according to stats listed on Wikipedia, which have been collected by the Japanese Coast Guard. That's a lot of ships. Yeah. Um, so at its narrowest point, the distance between South Korea and Japan is just 80 miles. Uh, but the distance between North Korea and Japan is like hundreds of miles. Literally, Literally hundreds of miles. Um, and all these boats are washing up at a rate at an average rate of about 90 per year. Uh, anecdotally, we know that this has been going on for decades, just that there's no official data prior to 2011. And it has continued to happen throughout 2020 and 2021. We just don't know the exact numbers. However, we do have to note that the number may be overstated because each piece of wreckage has been recorded as a separate boat. So it could have been that a boat has been like ripped in half and washed up in different places and have been recorded as two boats, not just like two boat parts. 
Um, there are also reports of these fishing boats being washed up in the Russian Far East, mostly in the coastal area close to Vladivostok and Ruski Island, uh, which is linked to Vladivostok by bridge. Uh, we haven't been able to find statistics for the number of boats wash washed up in the Russian Far East, but that might just be due to the fact that Russia is also a reclusive country in terms of international relations, although not quite to the same extent as North Korea. Because that just takes an extra level of dedication. Yeah. Uh, side note, Vladivostok is the second largest city in the Russian Far East, and it's where the Trans-Siberian Railway terminates. Uh, the railway was built to link the Russian Far East with European Russia, and obviously trans... Uh, traverses um, Siberia in between the two. It is in the extreme southeast of Russia and I think a lot of us, or possibly only me, somewhere in between, uh, tend to think of it as being like the extreme east and like where Russia ends mm -hmm. but the country does extend a lot further northeast to the point where it almost reaches Alaska because Alaska was Russia at mm -hmm. one point. And that's where it shares a maritime border with the USA. Yes, it does. So in many countries, particularly in Western Europe and North America, the days of sort of little wooden fishing boats are long gone. Um, these days, commercial fishing relies on much bigger vessels to fulfill their orders. There are, of course, small companies and local fishermen who only have small boats and relatively small catches for local shops and restaurants. But in the grand scheme of things, large-scale commercial fishing requires large trawler boats that can handle many days at sea in bad weather. But in the case of North Korea, the fishing boats that have been washing up on the coast of Japan and Russia are small, wooden, and in many cases in very poor states of repair. For a day's fishing a few miles off the coast, these boats would be fine. But for large-scale commercial fishing, they are <laughs> woefully under-equipped. The boats are generally identified as being from North Korea due to their dilapidated or quote-unquote primitive condition, as well as the writing on the boats, which we're led to believe differs slightly from South Korean script. North Korea does have fleets of fishing vessels, which are much larger and typically made of steel, closely resembling the fishing trawlers we recognize as commercial fishing vessels. But these are not washing up abroad because they are much more suited to fishing a long distance from shore. Why are dilapidated wooden fishing boats washing up along the coast might not be an immediate cause for concern, you know. Boats break away and wash up somewhere else. It happens, especially in bad weather. Yeah. It's what is washing up with them that has garnered global attention. Whereas plenty of wrecks and abandoned boats wash up on shore, there are also many of the fishing boats from North Korea washing up containing the bodies of the dead crew members. Oh. So we don't have exact numbers because it seems that the Japanese authority have not released this information when they release the number of boats washed up each year. Although there is data for 2017. So 104 boats were washed up on Japanese shores. There are at least 31 dead bodies found on these boats, but also 42 survivors. Oh. On the boats where the crew had died, the bodies were in varying stages of decomposition. Uh, some were completely skeletal, suggesting they'd been floating for quite some time. Uh, and other boats, uh, the bodies were only partial remains, suggesting they'd been scavenged at some point after death. Some, you know, maybe only a couple of days after death. Although there are plenty of conspiracy theories to explain this, and we'll get to those at some <laughs> point. <laughs> now... It would be very easy to write these deaths off as, you know, desperate people trying to escape North Korea by whatever means possible. And there is a precedent for that. It has happened yeah. before. These boats clearly aren't suitable for crossing the sea. But there is more to the story. There always is, isn't there? Mm. So, scholars from the Royal Institute of 
international affairs have suggested that although there is a history of people using small wooden fishing vessels to try and escape to Japan, it's unlikely that all of the ghost ships are people attempting to escape. This is because South Korea is much closer geographically than Japan or Vladivostok, as well as culturally and linguistically much closer to North Korea than Russia or Japan. So scholars believe that defectors are more likely to head for South Korea. Uh, there is a lot of discussion over the use of the term defectors because North Koreans aren't usually fleeing because of political dissent, but rather due to the poverty and deprivation they have experienced. Uh, the other reason South Korea is the preferred country for escapees is that South Korea recognizes North Koreans as Korean citizens and allows them to stay, whereas other countries, including Russia, China, and Laos, will deport them back to North Korea as illegal immigrants if they're discovered. Uh, Japan and other East Asian countries, including Thailand, Vietnam, and Mongolia, usually deport them to South Korea, although obviously that's... <laughs> Very simplified, and there's a lot more to it than simply crossing the border into the country and being re relocated to South Korea. So another reason that those who are dying at sea on these ghost ships aren't likely to be escapees is that the fishing industry in North Korea is tightly controlled by the military, precisely because otherwise it would be the perfect opportunity for people to attempt to escape. I mean, yeah. <laughs> So I've tried researching this, but I don't understand exactly how the military controls the fishing industry. But what I do understand is that the military supervises the industry, with fishermen having to hand over their catch to whichever unit they're assigned to. The fish is then handed over to the military for distribution, beginning with military personnel, because there's a military-first policy within the country. So sometimes the military are actually better looked after than the politicians. Mm. So recreational fishing is allowed, though. Uh, how it prevents people from trying to escape to another country once they're out on the water, they say, we're not entirely sure. But the heavy military presence along the coast and conditions in the prison camps, I assume, would pose a massive deterrent. <laughs> yeah. However, the fishing industry may be the reason behind the increasing number of boats washing up on foreign shores. Ew. Hope you're all still with us. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I've lost the plot at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, like, remember before when Kat was talking about territorial waters and exclusive economic zones, and we we're like, hey, is this a fishing podcast? What's going on? Well, remember that because this is where it all becomes relevant again. As food shortages and famine have become more common in North Korea over the past 30 years, along with the increasing sanctions being placed on the nation by the UN, the government has reportedly been selling rights to Chinese fishermen to fish within the North Korean exclusive economic zone uh, to generate income. That being said, North Korea has not passed any laws defining its exclusive economic zone, which complicates things somewhat. <laughs> uh, first, this breaches sanctions placed on North Korea that prohibit the country from, quote, earning foreign currency through the provision of fishing licenses to foreign vessels, according to an article by The Guardian. So sanctions are being breached through the sale of fishing quotas to other countries. But another problem is the sheer number of Chinese vessels known as dark fleets, fishing in North Korean waters, some with permits from North Korea and some without. So all of these extra vessels fishing in North Korea's waters has led to, a, to massive overfishing, um, with an estimated half a billion dollars worth of squid being caught by Chinese fishing vessels in 2017 and 2018. That's a shit ton of squid. Yeah. Um, so with less fish in the sea, quite literally, North Korean fishermen are being forced to travel further and further out to sea to find enough, enough fish to fulfill their quarters in boats that are nowhere near equipped enough for such long journeys on rough seas and like in bad storms that you get when you're way out to sea. Mm -hmm. 
So unable to compete with large industrial fishing trawlers, North Korean fishing fleets have been heading further north and into Russian waters, where they're now fishing illegally. (laughs) Uh, But unlike these big Chinese trawlers, the small wooden boats that are typically used by the North Korean fishermen just can't survive these harsh conditions and long distances required to find enough fish to fulfill their quotas. And this has led to boats becoming damaged and, you know, unsailable. Which I don't think is a word when you're on about sailing a boat. Yeah. <laughs> but they're just not seaworthy. Yeah. And eventually they're washing up on foreign shores. So that is the official story of North Korean ghost ships. <laughs> but, uh, there's more to come. Okay. Oh, don't check out quite yet. Okay. Oh, Thoughts? I mean, it's a lot of, as a lot of boats. It is. It's a lot of boats. It's a lot of deaths. Yeah. Um. In an like, in an already, I'd say like high mortality area. <laughs> yeah. Um. For lack of a better yeah. phrase. Yeah, because, I mean, when North Korea is talked about, it's always talked about as being, like, you know, the state killing their own people. Yes. Yeah. I don't think this is looked at in that same vein, even though because they're selling their fishing rights to these massive trawlers and these massive fleets coming in, their own fishermen are having to go further and further afield and they're essentially causing the deaths of their own people. Yeah. No, it's just, it's all a symptom of the same thing. It would be interesting to find out how many boats wash up on North Korean shores in this state. Uh-huh. And on South Korean shores as well, yeah. cuz that's South Korea isn't mentioned. Yeah, that's interest. That would be interesting to know about. Which I think also supports the idea that it's not people Def- trying to yeah. flee North Korea because they're typically sailing north into Russian waters. Yeah. It's, they're trying to find fish. Yeah. So that's the official explanation. Do you have anything else to add on the official explanation? Um, It kind of, I know this is kind of out of left field, but it kind of reminds me of like the, you know, the thing in, I think it was in like, Canada and like the Pacific Northwest that like f- like shoes with feet in them kept washing up on the shore. Oh, I I've heard of it. It is a chapter in a book I've mm-hmm. just bought about enigmas, but I haven't got to it okay, yet. Okay, well like basically it's the same kind of idea behind like so so like these tennis shoes like sneakers keep washing up on beaches in like Vancouver and mm-hmm. that that sort of area and like for a long time people were like oh like there's just like there's got to be like tons of murders happening or something and these are bodies washing up but like ultimately there's probably a really sort of simple explanation for it and it kind of reminds me of that this like the fishing boats thing because it's like mm-hmm. At first glance, it seems like really mysterious and sinister and like out there. And in actuality, it's like <laughs> the the after effects of like political and economic decisions between and really bad foreign yeah, policy. Yeah, really bad foreign policy. Like and in when it comes to the feet, like I think the generally accepted theory is that like, well, Sneakers float, and people end up in the water wearing sneakers, and, you know, Mm. that's what happens. So, like, yeah, it's one of those things that seems really, really crazy until you stop and kind of think about the possibilities, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So... Well, that's the official and probably, possibly the most likely explanation. There are a number of conspiracy theories 
Of course. Obviously. Uh, which go along with this. Is phenomenon the right word? Yeah. So one of them is that the North Koreans are trying to place sleeper agents, sleeper spies, in Japan. Okay. Which we know they've done. Every country has done it. Yeah. Every country puts sleeper agents in other countries. And the second conspiracy theory explains why we know that North Korea has done this. But tiny little wooden boats on the open ocean... The risk of being intercepted. Yeah. The risk that in a country like Japan, which typically, as we understand it, deports refugees back to South Korea. Yeah. Unless that's the goal, is to get sleeper agents into South Korea. (laughs) Which, like, seems like there'd be easier ways to do that, probably. Yeah. But yeah, so that was... So when I first heard about these North Korean ghost ships, it was on a podcast and I've driven Taylor mad this month because it's annoyed me so much that I cannot find this podcast again. Every time we record, I hear about this. (laughs) It is driving me mad to the point I think I might have made it up. (laughs) Um, So if anyone has listened to another podcast about North Korean ghost ships, please, please tell us. Yeah, send it our way because like... (laughs) It, it, this is this is truly the biggest mystery of our lifetime. <laughs> this theory was mentioned in this podcast, and I have seen it sort of referenced in articles about these these boats. You know, it's like oh, it's a possible explanation, but not likely. Yeah. But the podcast that I listened to had the most information on, and I can't remember. Oh it. no. <laughs> so yeah, but again, the, like you said, there are much easier ways to place agents inside japan yeah every government can forge like official documents and paperwork and everything like that it would be much easier to forge documents say if you want sleeper agents you want them pretending to be from that country yeah you want them to have nationality things like that so why not just fake the documents and get them in through legal channels? Yeah. Well, and also, like, you're not sending your spies to another country in a beat-up wooden fishing boat that's, like, fallen apart. No. It's just, that's just not what's going to happen. Like, we know, if we know anything about North Korea, which admittedly, not just us, but, like, the world doesn't know all that much, but what What is known is that they will spend the money they have on, like, intelligence and, like, information and military might and shows of, like, grandeur. So, like, I don't believe for a second that they're going to send their intelligence agents across an ocean in a fucking wooden boat. <laughs> there is a precedent for people trying to escape on on little fishing boats. Oh yeah, boats which like yeah, that to Japan and it has happened. I think there's like three or four kind of notable examples of it happening in the last like 30 years. Mm-hmm. It seems like a massive massive sacrifice just to get sleeper agents in yeah when you've got a country like like you say they will spend like the money on intelligence and military and things like that but when you've got a country like where your people are starving sacrificing the people who are bringing in the food yeah that's not smart so the second conspiracy theory is that the North Koreans are kidnapping Japanese citizens. Now, this has happened. It is known to have happened many times. So, officially, between 1977 and 1983, 17 Japanese nationals, 8 men and 9 women, were abducted from Japan by North Korea. And so... 
basically what it was was sort of opportunistic kidnapping. So it was people along the coast and taken to North Korea. And the reason, main reason this was done, is to train sleeper agents. <laughs> so yeah. you see where yeah. they link, link up yeah. now. So part of, well, the success of sleeper agents lies in them being able to pass the nationals of the country they're in. So you have to speak with like a flawless accent, which like, I don't know if anyone watched the Americans <laughs> when that was on. Like I only watched the first couple of seasons, but like, I know they're played by American actors, but they're Russian, but they speak with like flawless American yes. accent. And that is part of their training is so that they pass as, as American nationals. Mm. And it's the same thing for North, uh, North Korea want, wanting to put sleeper agents into Japan. They needed them to pass as Japanese with flawless Japanese accents, as well as like the mannerisms, the cultural, like cultural mannerisms. Uh, there is a theory that ships are washing up. Some say that it's kind of like a decoy for where people are being kidnapped. Others say that it's just like the North Koreans' efforts, that's what they have mm -hmm. to kidnap people from the shots. I'm not drawn to this idea. Again, it just seems like a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're going to carry out this kind of operation, like, you're not going to do it at such a scale. You're not mm. going to do it with 90 boats per year. Like, someone's no. going to notice. <laughs> um, and again, these would be more fleshed out if I could find the original sauce. Uh, it's out there somewhere. Which, uh... It's just going to haunt me for, uh... A long time. How appropriate for Halloween. Yeah. Oh, one thing I did forget to, to say is, so of these 17 Japanese people who've been kidnapped, who were officially recognized by North Korea as having been kidnapped, four were returned alive in 2002. They were repatriated. But the other 13, uh, I believe, to either have died in North Korea or North Korea denies involvement. Mm -hmm. It. yeah there are other reasons for people being kidnapped uh when i say people i mean women well yeah of course yeah so japanese women were abducted to be forced into sex slavery essentially mm -hmm. um because I refuse to say to be, you know, become wives of this this group of people or that group of people. Because that's not what happened. If you are forced into it, it is technically sexual slavery. Yeah. It's... That's no. human trafficking. <laughs> yeah. Because, um, yeah, that's one of the reasons it's given is that... Uh, they were abducted to become wives of a group of North Korean-based terrorists... Yeah, no, that's... That's human trafficking and sexual yeah, slavery. No. <laughs> nice try, but no. No. Um, especially when one of the youngest uh, abductees was 13. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Nope. Nope. Um, but yeah, so they're the most, like, the two, well... They do overlap a lot, but the two main theories as to as to why these boats are washing mm -hmm. up. Um, like I say, to me, I think they sound they both sound a bit of a stretch. Yeah, I agree with that. The like I say, the abduction of of Japanese citizens we know is fact and has happened, but. It, like and it was like very opportunistic, just people 
near the coast who could be grabbed, basically. Mm-hmm. But are you risking doing that in those kind of boats? No. Like, even if you can get there and snag someone, there's no guarantee you're going to make it back. Mm-hmm. Like, it just, it doesn't make yeah. sense. It seems very risky, and it just seems like not the most logical way to go about things. Not the most, mm-hmm. like, sneaky way to go about like uh, uh, just like there are better ways even for and for the, a place as sort of like backwards and a lot of its thinking and technology as north korea and also just thinking if you did try and do that why would you have markings on the boats that could identify it as north yeah korea? no totally like i yeah i think it's the fishing yeah as much as we love espionage yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's anything to do with no, spies. No, not this time. Um, Nor, unfortunately for the season, actual ghosts. No. A shame, really. I think that is all we have to yeah, say. I think so, too. If you've heard of the podcast I'm trying to think of, please tell me what it is. <laughs> um, Let us know your thoughts. Is it... Uh, Fishing or espionage. Or something else entirely. Ghosts. I thought you were going to say aliens. What, sea yetis? Yeah. Oh, didn't we just have this discussion about, like, we know nothing about what's in the ocean? We did. So, sea yetis. Mary Celeste. Mm. Jumbo squids and sea yetis. Well, it is a squid fishing region. See? Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow with yet another uh, Halloween episode. Oh, yes. Tomorrow. There's an honorary mention, I believe, of a boat. Oh, yes. But nothing to do with the sea. No, amazingly enough. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. We will see you then. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for thanks, listening. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.